bleeding gold. Austin flung open the door to the bathroom and stumbled over to the nearest stall. After closing the stall door, he frantically fumbled with the lock before finally securing it. He threw down the toilet lid so as to not sit on the disgusting seat that seemed to be covered in feces and globs of dried urine. Austin violently scratched his legs as he plopped down on the filthy porcelain throne. He wasted no time in dropping his pants and feeling along his left thigh for several moments before finally sensing a lump with his fingertips. Wasting no time, Austin awkwardly reached into his pant pocket, now down by his ankles, and fished out the box of razor blades he had stowed away in it. He took one of the pristine blades from the box and carefully lowered it to just above the spot on his leg where he had felt the lump. Austin took in a deep breath while a mix of anxiety and anticipation made him pause for a moment. Suddenly, a wave of unbearable pain forced Austin's hand, and he slid the blade an inch or two across his left leg, immediately drawing blood. He stared at the crimson liquid for several seconds before a surge of worry slammed into him, as Austin noticed the blood looked completely normal. Oh, God... He whispered to himself in a shaky voice. I missed the spot. Austin was a second away from frantically throwing toilet paper onto the wound to stop the bleeding, when, to his relief, a hardened speck of yellow crept out of the wound along with the blood. Several more specks quickly followed the first, each growing larger than the last. Austin sucked in a deep breath, then slowly let it out, as a feeling of euphoria immediately overtook the horrific pain he had just felt less than a minute ago. His limbs began to relax, and Austin simply stared at the chunks of gold freely flowing from the cut he had just made. It had been eight months since Austin first got the condition he was currently afflicted with, and the disease seemed to be getting more aggressive by the day. The old bag who put the curse on him must have been incredibly well-practiced in the dark arts, because Austin could find no other way to slow down the spread of gold throughout his body. No other way to stop the terrible burning that accompanied the process of his blood slowly turning into a metallic solid. He had to cut his flesh whenever the stinging sensation reared up, or he would be left with a useless body part like what had occurred to his right pinky. Austin held the worthless finger up to the light as the euphoria from the cut began to wear off. The small appendage was a sickly yellow color and had permanently hardened to the point where Austin would have to work on it with a pair of shears for several minutes if he wanted to remove the pinky. It was a preview of the horrifying fate that eventually awaited Austin, no matter how many times he ripped the affliction from his flesh. He glanced back at the cut to see the gold had finally started to clot the open wound, leaving behind a colorful scab that easily stood out against the pale tone of his skin. Austin took a moment to glance over all the other gold-colored scabs that covered his legs, altogether taking up a great deal of his skin's surface area. He was quickly running out of undamaged patches of skin, which was obviously a huge problem, but there was an even bigger one he had to also contend with. Simply put, every time he cut open the part of his flesh that was being attacked by the curse, it felt good. Perhaps too good. It started to seem like nothing else in the world mattered to Austin except for the incredible sensation that overtook him each time he physically cut gold from his body. To make the situation worse, the feeling only managed to last for a minute or two, not nearly enough time to offset the agony endured beforehand. So, Austin had started to actually want the curse to hit him harder. Sure, that would mean more pain, but it also meant more of that incredible sensation, and Austin was fine with that. That feeling was the only thing that seemed to occupy his mind anymore. As soon as the euphoria was over, Austin immediately wanted more, and that was the state of mind he found himself in while sitting on that disgusting toilet. That's when Austin got an idea. If the curse was picking up steam and solidifying his blood at a more rapid pace, 
then there surely had to be specks of it flowing throughout his entire body. That meant he could remove bits of the affliction from anywhere, and that's precisely what he aimed to do as he rolled up his right sleeve. Austin ripped the freshly used blade over a patch of skin and let out a grunt of pain while blood poured from the wound. He impatiently waited for the hurt that rippled through his arm to disappear and for it to be replaced with that magical feeling he so desperately craved. Suddenly, the sensation hit Austin from out of nowhere and his whole body went limp as his senses were overwhelmed by pleasure. As he sat motionless on top of the public toilet, Austin had no idea what would kill him first, the curse or the blood loss, and he didn't care. He was absolutely fine with any kind of death, as long as he kept getting that otherworldly feeling of pleasure with each cut of his flesh. Darkest Nightmares You've never been afraid of the dark. You used to mock your friends when they told you their horror stories of what lurked in the dark in middle school. Once or twice in the past, you may have had some trepidation before stepping into the dark, but you were a senior now, and you knew there was no such things as monsters. There were no vampires hunting in the perfect darkness of night, no zombies waiting to grab your ankles when you couldn't see where you were stepping, and there were certainly no ghosts waiting for you to turn the lights out so they could appear in your bedroom. These were the nightmares you never had, because there was no reason to fear what didn't exist. You never had a reason to fear the dark, but if you had, maybe you wouldn't be where you are right now. It was always a show of fearlessness when you took the unlit alleyway as a shortcut on your way home. Not every time, but when you were walking with some friends and the opportunity presented itself, you would slink down that path while they went around, hoping they wouldn't notice you were gone You'd wait until they were just about to the other end of the alleyway, and you'd leap out and give them a scare. You further solidified their fear of the dark while alleviating your own with each uneventful trek through the darkness. At least, until that time where it took your friends a little bit longer to realize you were gone. For the first time, you encountered something unexpected in the void of light. It grabbed you, choked you, and as you thrashed, you felt even more of these beings as they grabbed your arms and legs and pinned them. The last thing you heard before succumbing to unconsciousness was the panicked voices of your friends calling out to you. Now you have nightmares every night. That's not to say the iron cage you're locked in brings you any comfort when you awake. The grimy metal encloses all around you, not giving you enough room to even stretch your legs. You have a single pillow, sticky and smelly, unwashed for who knows how long, that you rest your head on, curled up in the fetal position, while your naked body shivers on the cold floor. No, there is nothing that you want to be awake for, except to escape what you now see every time you close your eyes. When you're lucky, you're still just in the cage. At least time passes quicker that way. But more often, you imagine the grotesque faces and shapes of the monsters that now hold you and what their plans might be. These nightmares have become deeply ingrained into your mind, and the idea of monsters no longer seems so laughable to you. This dreamscape of horrors runs rampant in your sleep, as if making up for the lost years of peaceful nights. It's been dark for days now, maybe weeks, Dim lights illuminate some spots around you, and you see other cages, more captives of these creatures. But no one makes a sound, for fear of attracting too much attention from their captors. Food comes scarcely, a putrid gruel, just edible enough to keep you alive. You eat it, praying that salvation may come. But this routine continues, day after day, weaning you from your hopes and prayers. But one day, the routine stops. You hear something unfamiliar across the room. Metal creaking and moaning, sounds of pleading, and muffled cries echo through the chamber, slowly approaching you. Eventually, they make their way to your personal prison. The cage door creaks as it opens, 
but you merely weep quietly as your hands are tied and a gag fills your mouth, knowing that nothing you can say will sway this creature. It pushes you into a line with the other victims, and slowly you march along until the line approaches a single heavy door. One by one, captives are marched through this door as it opens and slams shut behind them. No one has come back out. After living in this hell, through the nightmares and the darkness, you almost welcome the thought of your death beyond this door. Every few minutes, another victim passes through. Maybe it's a quick death, you hope. You hope for painless, too, but life could hardly be that fair. Only two more remain in front of you. You imagine saying goodbye to your friends and family. One left. You pray for forgiveness, just to be safe. Now it's just you and the door. You hear nothing beyond it. Silence surrounds you. You look behind you. You can just make out a figure standing there. There is no escape. You accept death and prepare yourself. The door opens and a hand grabs you to pull you inside. You hear the door slam shut behind you. The same hand pulls you forward by the wrist a few more steps. It is unmistakably human. It lets go, and after just a moment's wait, a bright light blinds you. It seems brighter than any light you've ever seen before. You turn about and try to find the source, but suddenly that never-ending silence was broken by the murmuring of voices. You stop moving and hope for your vision to return as quickly as possible. Gradually, you begin to make out faces, people. They stare at you in near darkness from slightly below. You finally find the source of the light above you, and you realize you're on a stage. Your mind races to explain what's happening, but as you look over the faces of the crowd in front of you, there's one you recognize. A teacher of yours, Mr. Corman. You're in his physics class right now, and you can tell by the shocked look on his face that he recognizes you. You try to call out, to beg for help, but the gag ensures only muffled nonsense comes out. You only get to plead for a few seconds before a voice booms over an intercom. This is the last one for tonight, people, so lay down what you've got now. Bidding starts at 10,000. Hands go up in the crowd, raising the bids higher, and you can only watch in horror as your last hope, Mr. Corman, breaks a sly smile over his face and raises his hand as well. You were right about monsters, at least. They don't exist. But as you look at the sadistic faces filling the crowd in front of you, you understand that there are far more sinister things hiding in the dark, and that your nightmares are just beginning. Farewell, brother. Marcy peeked through the small closet door opening as the clicking noise drew ever closer. As soon as she witnessed a small blot of gray flesh appear in the corner of her vision, she instinctively pulled her head back several inches. The back of Marcy's head lightly brushed against a set of clothes, creating the tiniest squeak as one of the metal hangers just barely moved. Marcy froze in complete terror while anxiously waiting in near darkness for something to happen. After a moment that seemed to draw out for several hours, a clicking noise sounded from somewhere off to the right, past the closet. Marcy brought her eye back to the small crack once more and focused her gaze on her bedroom window. There, she easily spotted the abomination peering out into the backyard through the molded glass. The moonlight bathed the terrifying creature, allowing Marcy to see its emaciated frame and the lifeless color of its skin. It was hunched over in a position similar to that of a bullfrog, as it supported most of its weight by relying on the twisted appendages that Marcy assumed were legs. Her focus slowly shifted from the unmoving creature and made its way to the near pitch black spot under her bed. Though it was nearly impossible to see him, Marcy could barely make out her brother's form. Daryl must have been absolutely terrified as the beast's legs were mere inches from touching the bed. 
Marcy was completely surprised that her brother had managed to stay hidden from the creature for so long. Daryl had always been the more cowardly sibling, so Marcy had expected him to give his position away with some incessant whimpering. Yet, that had obviously not been the case. Marcy brought her focus back to the abomination to see the thing's elongated fingers scraping its claw-like nails against the glass. It was becoming clear that the beast was not going to leave the room for quite some time, unless it had a reason to. Marcy decided that she would create a reason for the beast to act. She tentatively reached behind her head, cautiously feeling for the hanger she had bumped into a moment prior. Once her fingers touched the cold bit of metal, she carefully unhooked it and brought it down to her chest. Marcy took in a long and steady breath of air to fill her lungs, before painstakingly pushing the closet door open just a few more centimeters. She brought her hand halfway out of the opening before pausing, her confidence quickly slipping away. Marcy's mind suddenly flashed back to the scene of her mutilated parents lying in a heap in the living room, their entrails decorating the walls. That alone strengthened her resolve, and Marcy chucked the wire hanger at the bed frame. The object hit its mark, clattering off the piece of furniture before landing on the ground with a hollow thump. Marcy heard the creature snarl in surprise before its head whipped towards the sound of the noise. As the abomination crouched down to peek under the bed, Marcy could hear her brother let out a shriek of pure terror. No, Daryl screamed. Help me, Marcy! As the creature eagerly tried to rip Daryl from under the bed, Marcy carefully slipped through the gap in the closet. She cautiously shimmied her way to the door of the bedroom, feeling a small twinge of guilt as she reached the exit. Marcy gave a quick look over her shoulder, back at the spot where Daryl was fighting for his life. Farewell, brother, she whispered as she fled down the hallway. Every night he cuts his face. Every night I'm haunted by the form of a little boy hunched atop my dresser. He stays hunkered there, wearing nothing more than a pair of tidy whities and smiles at me. The little boy stays that way for hours and watches me as I lay in bed. Initially, I believed I was experiencing some really strange nightmares, but I know for sure that I am awake when this happens. Then, my mind pondered the possibility that I was merely hallucinating. I no longer think that is the case either. He would giggle his child's giggle when I would awaken from my deep slumber, and then he would set about his nightly ritual of tingling my spine with his impossibly still muscles. Then, one night, he did something that sent me reeling. He took a straight razor from the back band of his underwear and unfolded it slowly, letting the twinkle of the moonlight coming in through the window reflect off of it. He would roll and twist the thing in his hands, toying with it and laughing. My mouth would go dry, unable to let out a peep. The little boy holds it above his head and then brings the blade down in a swift, whistling arch. I must jump at this little demonstration because he is amused by my reaction. He follows this up with a broad smile, then presses the end of the blade to his temple, dragging the laceration downward underneath his chin, up around again to his other temple, then across his hairline until the bloody line meets the beginning. The boy follows this with a messy job of circles around the eyes and mouth. He does this all with a steady wrist. He folds the razor as his face drip drops its red nectar onto the floor below and puts the blade away. Do you like masks? asks the boy. I refuse to speak, or my mouth refuses to cooperate. He presses his fingertips along the line the razor created and wiggles his nails beneath the skin, prying the flesh up. I can hear the popping protests of the tissue. He peels off his face and holds it out in front of his chest as an offering. 
When I recoil and squint my eyes, he flattens his palm and places the face out over it meticulously. He tosses the thing like a pie and it smacks and sticks to the opposite wall of my bedroom. I watch the face slide down my wall, leaving a trail in its path. When I look back to the dresser, the boy is gone. When I look to the wall, the face is gone, but the stain remains. This is what my nights have been, and I don't know how much longer I can take it. My wall is covered in the macabre shapes of at least thirty faces. The skin has some quality to it that they are impossible to remove from the wall. So the drooping faces look on forever, as I am unable to pry them from the drywall. The other night I awoke, sure he would be waiting to conduct his game of scaring the ever-loving shit out of me. But he wasn't there. I relaxed, my breathing felt normal, my eyes grew heavy once more. As I rolled onto my back, my heart caught in my throat. The little boy was perched on my headboard, staring down at me with that twinkle in his eye. No, the twinkle wasn't in his eye. He was brandishing the straight razor in front of a wicked smile. He cut his face off and held it out in front of his chest, directly over my face, as I looked on in abject terror. It's your mask, spit the boy through dribbling blood. I don't know how, but the courage lingered in me to jerk from the bed. I darted down the hall, out the door, into my car, and shot up gravel rocks as I floored it out of my driveway. When I worked up the courage to return home, I examined my bed. There's an irremovable face on my pillow. The skin mask grew strange and knotty roots so as to better cling to the fibers. I shuddered to think what would have happened if he'd dropped it on me. I'm moving. Immurement Thomas desperately felt his hands against the bricked-off surface for some imperfection or crack. His fingers frantically searched every crevice in place of his eyes, which were utterly useless in the pitch-black darkness. Constant droplets of sweat poured down from Thomas's brow, thanks to the ever-rising temperature in the sealed-off area he found himself trapped in. Each time Thomas moved, it seemed as though the space got a tad bit hotter. After scouring every inch of the bricked wall in front of him to no avail, Thomas let out a pathetic whimper before slumping to the floor. He tried to take a deep breath to calm down, but the air was musty and he ended up furiously coughing instead. The closed walls echoed the sounds of his coughs back at Thomas, hurting his ears from the amplified noise. Thomas's coughs turned into sobs as the true hopelessness of his situation finally washed over him. The air around him tasted of dirt and death, with the flavor growing ever stronger with each breath. Thomas knew it wouldn't be long before the supply of oxygen ran out, a thought which caused him to sob even harder. Thomas continued to weep over his approaching demise as his mind replayed past memories of his life. He went through all his loved ones in his head, trying to think how all of them would react to his death. As Thomas thought about those he'd be leaving behind, his brother naturally floated into his brain. He wondered if what he was going through now was how his brother felt in his last moments. The thought of his little brother, gasping for air while trapped in an enclosed space with no one there to help him, suddenly lit a seething rage inside of Thomas. He scrambled to his feet and began to kick at the wall with all the fury he could muster. Thomas's shoes harmlessly bounced off the brick, but he continued to strike the wall before him. The frustration of not being able to break out of his tomb only added to Thomas's anger, pushing him to the point where he started to punch the brick. Thomas's hands immediately flared with agony upon the first hit, but his raw emotion overpowered his common sense, and he kept punching. Thomas continued until he felt something break in his left hand as a wave of agony simultaneously shot up his arm. 
He couldn't help but let out a knee-jerk roar of pain before furiously kicking the wall with his right leg. Thomas continued to do so until a similar sensation of agony engulfed his foot, causing him to stumble backward. He couldn't maintain his balance and fell, slamming his head against the back wall of his tomb. The hit caused Thomas's mind to lose clarity, and the boy fell over on the floor, his limbs flopping against the ground. I just wanted to find Jake, Thomas mumbled weakly. His mind randomly thought back to Mr. Stowers, asking, Thomas, do you know what immurement is? Thomas spat in disgust at the recollected words of his horrific neighbor. The man was a monster that had managed to fool everyone. All the years of missing children, heartbroken parents, and sleepless nights lying awake in fear were all because of Mr. Stowers. Thomas felt his mind start to drift toward unconsciousness, and he couldn't seem to fight it, try as he might. His eyes lazily drifted towards the wall before him, where he happened to notice a small beam of light shining through. Thomas gasped in surprise as his muddled mind managed to understand that he had done just enough to loosen one of the bricks in the wall. It was a final moment of hope that Thomas tried to cling to as his mind seemed to automatically power down. I'm coming, Jake, Thomas mumbled incoherently as he drifted off into unconsciousness. Tap, 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 tap. Do not do it. Do not give it the satisfaction. Maybe this time it'll go away. I had to force myself not to turn around and look at my window. Eyes bore into the back of my skull and yet the constant tapping was ever so slowly dwindling down. I could almost hear the frustration of the creature. At first, I thought it must have been a tree branch, but a tree branch does not stand four feet tall and have it out for me. I focused in on my computer screen, trying to block out the sound. Music was ineffective, and turning on the TV only made it worse. I checked the time. It was 3.24 a.m., Six more minutes. Six more minutes and you are free, I told myself. The minutes dragged on, slowly inching towards 3.30 a.m. The tapping echoed throughout the room, vibrating through my mind. 3.26 a.m. 3.29 a.m. Right on cue, the tapping ceased at exactly 3.30 a.m., as per usual every day the past week. I sighed and turned around to finally crash on top of my bed and get what little sleep I could. Relieved to finally be able to sleep in peace, I turned back and forth to find a comfortable spot. That was when I saw it. It was tiny, almost the size of a small child. Its eyes seemed unnatural to its body, too big and bulky. Its skin was a pale gray and resembled stretched hide. Long, thin pieces of hair grew from random spots on its head. It had a permanent smile, its rotten, jagged teeth pressed up against my window. It was standing on my windowsill, its bony finger tapping on the pane, creating a sick rhythm. It pressed its stubby face against my window. I sat frozen in fear eyes locked and unsure of what to do. It just stared at me, unblinking and unmoving. I shook in both terror and uncertainty. It began to tilt its head like a confused dog, still unblinking. A couple of minutes passed, and it had still not blinked once. Its eyes remained glued to mine. Almost synchronizing with my clock on the far end of the room, drawing out the night endlessly, its god-awful tapping reverberating within my skull and filling my thoughts. Part of me wanted to get up and scream at it, but I was paralyzed. It just stared and continued to tap. 
Eventually, the sun began to rise behind the tree line. The rays of light struck my window, and then the creature. It twisted its head around to investigate the source, and then turned back at me. Its smile widened at me one last time, and the creature vanished into the woods. Exhausted and terrified, I lay down in bed to catch the last hour of sleep I could. It would be a while until my body forced sleep upon me. The next night, I prepared myself for tapping. However, it never happened. I drew the blinds, turned off the light, and lay down for a hopefully peaceful sleep. I let out a sigh of relief. One more night of it and I would have gone. I sprung up, my ears straining and jumping at every creak and groan of the house. After a few minutes, the tapping was heard again. Not tapping on glass, no. A deeper tap. It was the sound of finger on wood. And it was from across the room. It was from inside my closet. <laughs> 